Hello! It's time for my first book review. And again, I'm going to be reviewing Cunt, A Declaration of Independence by Inga Musio. Inga Musio is a feminist that both speaks and writes on the subjects of gender issues and race issues. Inga admits at the beginning of the book that she's living in a middle-class home and her basic needs have been provided for. Musio wants to also reappropriate the word cunt to serve women, in her words. She feels that men and the patriarchy, rather, are teaching women to fear themselves and to look at themselves through a man's eyes, through men's eyes. So you, there's a whole bunch of other assumptions that are made on the character of men and on the intelligence of women, so to speak, throughout this book, and her desire to reappropriate the word cunt is all about her attempt to try to reframe language in terms of women's standpoint. Musio has pretty much made it very clear in the book that guys like me, rather all men, are afraid of vaginas, afraid of women, afraid of their cuntness so to speak. She's so... she distrusts men so vehemently that if she knows that men are involved in the production of anything that could arguably be for the benefit of women, she won't have anything to do with it. She says so explicitly in the book. I don't know, he's white and that means he's racist and he's a man which means he's sexist. There's nothing circular about what I'm saying, it's totally fair and equal. Only women can identify with other women, and I spelled women with a Y just for your information. You're from the patriarchy, you don't understand. Eat me. So we end up with these interesting setups where she will forget to put in a diaphragm for sex, she refuses to take morning after pills, and she doesn't really talk that much about condoms. There was one little spiel she went on about it but she did not discuss how her boyfriend had dealt with condoms in the book. She did not discuss using contraceptives with her male contraceptives at all in her relationship. And I guess, unsurprisingly, she ended up being pregnant three times. And she also got three abortions. And what I think is really interesting about it is that she complains about abortions. She says it's the worst thing ever, it's a completely traumatic experience, which is why she got three of them. And then on her third abortion, she decided, you know what, I'm not going to do the vacuum anymore, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this more holistic thing. So she invited friends over to do these unsafe massages that are supposed to disturb the uterus, and she, I shit you not, discusses a technique called imaging, where she wills the baby away. Like, she lays in bed, and she thinks of her fucking kid dying. And this, and eventually she had a miscarriage in the bathroom. The fucking embryo rolled out of her, rolled out of her, and ended up as a bloody marble on the bathroom floor. And she goes on for a couple pages bragging about her accomplishment. Like it was amazing. Like she was so happy about succeeding in her own abortion that she initiated and that she willed. And I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm all for bodily autonomy and all that, but that's a corpse. <laughs> I mean, this is... I mean, it's granted that's not a full human being, but that... Have a little remorse. Now, to be clear, I'm pro-choice, and that is, I'm pro-symmetrical choice as well. I believe that both men and women deserve a chance to choose whether or not they want to be parents, but it's a difficult choice. It's a difficult choice that I wish that people don't have to go through if they can, if they can help it. So that said, even though I'm pro-choice, I am not pro-reckless choice. This was fucking reckless. This is reckless behavior. In Musio's distrust for men in modern medicine, she refuses to use any pads or tampons or anything. So she, so what she does is she uses sea sponges and cuts up towels to get some rags. And she also has this one uh, blood towel, as she calls it. She says, Linus from Peanuts, me and my blood towel. So, um, I really cannot do, I can really cannot summarize what I'm about, what I saw here on page 47. Let me read this to you. Um, in the morning, I walk around the house with my blood towel wrapped around my waist. It catches the flow when I sit down. I use it to wipe the insides of my legs. Otherwise, the blood splatters on my feet, the floor, and I step in it and get it everywhere. Sometimes I don't clean it up right away. Messy, messy, finger paints in kindergarten messy. 
I like to do this for a very good reason. Because I can. Isn't it amazing? By the simple act of not wearing panties, I can stand in the middle of my kitchen and change the way it looks. Without moving a muscle, a pool of blood appears between my feet like magic. Lady, you're gross. So let me reframe the discussion here. Pretty much up to that point in the book, she says that women are taught to, in essence, feel that their menstrual cycles are dirty. And I think that when she framed the discussion that way, if someone like me were to come along and say, hey lady, you're bleeding all over the goddamn floor, don't you think that's kind of gross? All of a sudden, this kind of makes it look like people like me are contributing to the same narrative that she's saying is oppressive and horrible. So. I fucking hate those rhetorical tricks where the discussion is framed such that if you try to disagree, it makes you look like an asshole. Fuck you, lady. Bleeding all over the goddamn floor. What the hell's wrong with you? And just so we're clear, there's nothing scary or disgusting or unnatural about what you're doing in the abstract. It's just that when I read, when I'm reading your book, I get this image of a woman who over-ritualizes the menstrual cycle up to a lunar calendar with a red pen. She will only mark the lunar calendar with a red pen. and she's go So I'm getting this image of a woman who's walking around the house with no panties but has a ripped up towel around her waist, who's bleeding all over the full floor, leaving bloody footprints everywhere that lead to a window where I'm seeing this, where you see this woman staring intently out to the sky specifically to look at the moon. It's right out of a fucking horror film. As earlier in the book, uh, Musio talks about parties that celebrate menstruation. We're talking about a red cake with red with red presents with red gifts inside. And I think, okay, that's pretty cool. I think I, I can see that. I can see a theme party that talks about celebrating what a lot of kids would be intimidated by the first time they experience it and it's good to remind them that it's perfectly normal. And I, I don't know, I, I think it's kind of funny again when you flip the sexes and you think about a party about a boy's first erection. Wouldn't that be the most awkward thing ever? You're, you're, you're just, you go up to your dad and you say, hey, dad, my pee-pee's hard. What, 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 what up? And then you have this white party. You get a clown coming in wearing this big sperm outfit. Everybody gets snow cones. Page 84, stick your finger, middle finger's best, up your cunt, swipe it around and around your cervix, being careful not to neglect the underside, where secretions like to settle. If you are ovulating, you will find a nice blob of snot on your finger. There is no seemly way to describe this. It's snot, quite unmistakably plain and simple snot. It pretty much goes on like that for a while. Now, during the rest of the book, she kind of leaves the whole theme of talking about her own body and starts talking more about how awful men are, and she blames men for everything, and including, not only does she blame men for war, but she also assumes that men are going to be the perpetrators of all the rapes that will happen during the war, according to her, and essentially every country is founded on the bodies of raped women. This is, I'm not making this up. Now, there are times when in her complaints about men, she, say, she says things that are just factually inaccurate. She says here on page 117 that gazillions of dollars, in her words, are poured into research for prostate cancer and male-to-male -male transmission for HIV, and compared to money being put into breast cancer research and female-to-female -female transition of HIV. I left a link in the low bar to some comparisons of federal spending on research in these areas from 1992 to 2000. The copyright for this book is 1998. Take a look at the numbers for yourself. I do not think that covers all possible funding sources, but it is government funding, and I think that says a lot right there. Okay, table one in the document I left in the low bar. National Cancer Institute research dollars for various cancers, fiscal year 1992 to 2000, in millions. So on 1998, uh, an act, under actual, we've got breast cancer at $348.6 million. And for prostate cancer, we've got, under 1998, same column, $86.9 million. I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. Now what's interesting about this, this table is that breast cancer research funding from the NCI is consistently at least three times higher than prostate cancer research funding except for 1999 and 2000, which I'm assuming are both estimate columns. 1999 is labeled estimate, but 2000 is labeled president's budget. So, assuming that 
she wrote these words in 1998 or before, she did. She might not have even seen the estimate for 1999-2000. I don't know if she did or not. But up to that point, breast cancer research funding was consistently orders of magnitude higher. And yet she says the exact opposite. And I, again, this is just one organization, but it's federal. It's something that is state-sponsored, and that carries a lot of weight in this discussion, in my mind, anyway. So it kind of shows that the people who are in power, who are in government, are the ones that are put, shoveling money toward breast cancer research in comparison for prostate cancer research. Now, I don't really know about HIV, and I'm not too clear on the details on that one, but breast and prostate, lady, just look it up. Now I'm going to go ahead and say some areas of the book I did identify with. She, uh, Inga thinks that we should be more open about sex, and I agree wholeheartedly. We're too repressed about sex, and I think that's true. Now, she does go on to say that it's men's fault that we end up in these states to begin with, and it's also men's fault for the horrible things that come as a result of sexual repression, and she has a laundry list of things like a rape and war and all that. So, yeah, we kind of disconnect there. Now, one of the statements that she makes in this book that I want to hold her to is on page 137. Quote, Every way we see, hear, feel, taste, and smell is a self-reflection. Our perception, awake and asleep, is what we, we, we choose to perceive. The way we react to any stimulus is the way we choose to react. Then what you would do is you would take your rubber reflex hammer, or your ruler if you have it, locate your patellar tendon with your other fingers, and then after you've located it, put your hammer, rest it against it, and then tap. But what the fuck does he know? He's a white man. Then on page 157, we have this, quote, When I hear of a man murdering a woman, I assume that he raped her unless I read the fucking coroner's report myself, unquote. I think that the attitude taken to writing this book is in serious contention with her statement of self-reflection. Inga presumes guilt on the part of men throughout the entire book. It is just an assumption, an axiom. And I'm of the innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt variety, so of course there's just going to be that huge disconnect there. And I think that through all of the hatred, through all of the, I guess you could say, bigotry masquerading as self-acceptance, all of that is brought to a head, I think, on page 131. In the beginning of a chapter called Acrimony of Cunts, the first couple of sentences, I think, are the best lines in the book because they're so unbelievably, they're just unbelievable. Quote, my mind is very logical. Thoughts are a kind of math to me. Unquote. <laughs> so let's wrap this up. My overall thoughts, Inga is crazy. She's, uh, she's a misinterest in every sense of the word. She's a gynocentrist. She even thinks that the fact the fact that we have a word PMS and the way that people look at PMS and the way that we look at female serial killers is all still based on a masculine, patriarchal, um, I guess you could say precedent. And it's all assumed. There's no real basis for it. It's a very emotional, very personal, very um, irrational book in my mind. And I really don't think me being a man has anything to do with that judgment call. It just is irrational. It just is bigoted. Now let me go ahead and say that Inga is still blogging today. She's still available for public speaking engagements. So I don't know how much of her views have changed over the little over a decade that has passed since the Kant of Declaration of Independence was first published. But her claim to fame or whatever fame that she has, is attributable to this book. So if she's rewarded that strongly for her views, I think that's pretty scary. And frankly, if you disagree, again, that's fine. But um, if you enjoyed this review, I appreciate you taking the time to watch it. And if you want to see more videos like this, please consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel. You can also subscribe to my Daily Motion channel if you prefer to use Daily Motion. And there will be more books coming up that we will discuss. But um, if you were to ask me if I'd recommend you buy Kant Declaration of Independence, no. 
I do not recommend it. But I'm glad I read it. It's important to be aware of the kind of attitudes that are out there. Victor Zen out.